So, I will talk to you about how to compile Rust to the browser. That might sound a bit weird now, it also sounds weird later, but we will see how it works at least. Um, first warning, there will be a few GIFs. I hope you all don't have a problem with that. There will also be tweets, but just for fun. Um, so, first, there was only HTML for displaying websites in the browser, right? So you could display pretty static content. Um, and only later, the browsers gained the possibility to have some dynamic user interaction. And that was done through using JavaScript, a language that was implemented in just a few days. And we can still see that from time to time in the language. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm more going to focus on where we got uh, since the old days. So when JavaScript came to be, more and more people started to using it first to make sites more interactive and then to build full applications that worked in the browser. From time to time, that really slowed down the applications because of the huge amounts of JavaScript that were there. And in the beginning, all the JavaScript engines that were there were more or less just basic interpreters of JavaScript, which is actually quite slow. But later, we got some really high performance uh, JavaScript engines that made this stuff even worthwhile to build huge applications in. And today, we have applications like your emails are probably somewhere in the browser as well, like Gmail or whatever mail provider you use. There is a full Office suite in the browser. You can build the presentations in your browser. You can uh, do music. You can even connect to Bluetooth devices. You can basically do nearly everything with JavaScript by now. And this has a lot to do with how the uh, engines that execute your JavaScript got optimized. And um, one thing that came to be just after the now known engines were um, released in about 2008 and 2009, mscripten was started, which is basically um, a program that takes whatever comes out of LLVM and ports this, or translates this to JavaScript. And this allows you to, for example, take C or C++ and run that on the web at near full-time speed compared to if you compiled it natively and run it natively. Um, this, there's a whole lot of code in this project, but actually the smallest part of it is the compiler. Because actually transpiling from LLVM to something else seems quite easy, but the optimizations you have to do on the LLVM or in the generated code is, is what takes the most uh, of the code. So now you might ask, why, wanna, do, uh, why do we want to do this? Well, compiling to the web actually brings a few advantages. The first is J JavaScript is actually a standard that we can follow and that is implemented nearly everywhere and that runs everywhere. Your phone runs it, the laptop runs it, even your server can run it, and whatever device in between you can imagine it can probably run some form of JavaScript. There are even microcontrollers out there that run your JavaScript. So that's actually a pretty uh, good target to compile for because we can run it everywhere. I'm not saying that it's actually a good language to run everything in, but we have to deal with what we have now. And also, more and more stuff is move, moving to the web. As I said before, we have the big applications that you already use in your browser, and all this is actually a pretty big code, and often there were applications that existed before, but the cost of porting this to native JavaScript are often quite high. So what you want to do is just take the existing project, compile it to JavaScript, and just run it in the browser. And the third thing is that we can just reuse native libraries, especially now that we got more applications in the browser, we probably want to reuse what we have already, for example, crypto libraries or libraries for image processing or audio processing or stuff that was already there in the world where we have natively compiled binaries. So mscripten all provided this by taking your C code, pushing it through LLVM and giving you some JavaScript code. So it turns out the JavaScript code that mscripten outputs, you can't really read it. You won't understand the most parts of it. And that is because it's using a pretty low-level subset of JavaScript. And this subset actually was later standardized or at least specified in what's now called ASMJS. ASMJS is basically a subset of all of JavaScript, which gives you certain guarantees about how the code looks and how it behaves. 
This actually now allows browsers to optimize for exactly the code that is expected. And for example, Firefox can take this code if it's annotated correctly and compile it ahead of time. So you don't have the just-in-time compiler you have for other engines. So, um, ASM code is very simple and low level and therefore it should be easy, right? Well, it's certainly not. That has a lot to do with how JavaScript itself works. But some parts of it are actually easy to understand. For example, the ASMJS makes JavaScript implicitly typed. So basically, JavaScript only has a very basic amount of types, which is it has doubles, it has strings, and it has some objects. But from up, apart from that, there is no real type. So the thing is, if you have, an, if you have some number and do a binary uh, or operation with zero, the number won't change. But what will happen here is that the engine executing the JavaScript, it will understand what you're doing. And because binaries don't, uh, binary operations don't make sense on floats or doubles, it will turn this into a 32-bit 30 32 integer value. And what that means is that the addition operation later performed is just an integer operation. So it can optimize that down to actually executing only the single integer Oper at operation on the machine. So this gives you the implicit typeness. And while I said Firefox has the add of tile compile, compiling to uh, compile this code into machine code, uh, the V8, the engine in Chrome, does not have this. It only has just-in-time compilation, but it has mechanisms to detect that the code is implicitly typed and do the same compilation just in time. So it will optimize the ASMJS code just the same, just not ahead of time. Um, so we talked a lot about um, how to use memory before. And the, um, the memory model in C or in LLVM is actually pretty simple. We have some big large memory we can point to and take uh, or assign values to. And uh, we can have pointers somewhere and just do arithmetic on it and point somewhere else. If we do it right, we will just land in the right parts of the buffer and it will just work. If we just do a calculation off by one, we will probably break our code. But in case we're doing it right, we will get some pretty efficient code. For example, uh, this is a um, primitive implementation of the string length function in C. What we basically need to do is we get a pointer, um, we get a pointer, and we just increase the pointer until we reach the null byte. Not, uh, strings in C are always terminated with a null, and then later just subtract the uh, pointers from each other, and that's the difference between them is the actual length of the string in the in the memory. When we put this through M script and compile it down to Jav JavaScript, what we get is this or this. Um, what ASMGS actually does, it emulates the heap by just allocating one large buffer of space. And the pointers are now just integers pointing into this array. And from there, we can do the same calculations on pointers. We can check for the values at certain points. We can uh, just iterate through um, everything until we reach the null byte and then calculate the difference again. Apart from uh, being quite similar to the C model and ju thus just translating the C model of memory management into uh, JavaScript, we have another uh, advantage here, at least for some programs, and that is the garbage collector has nothing to do with this. It only sees one large array, which it won't remove because there's always a reference to it. This, is, this can be quite wasteful for short-running programs because there's always one large buffer. But for long-running programs that actually use uh, most of the memory, this is quite efficient because we don't have to rely on an additional memory management on top of what our original application does anyway. So there are both advantages and disadvantages. Um, there are implementations that could make this buffer grow uh, by, by the time, but there are 
always quite complex to implement and it's not always clear if that actually improves stuff uh, by huge quantity. So what I now showed you is the ASM.js part. That is already implemented and it works by using mscripten. There are other uh, implementations that also can translate LLVM. Um, I don't have the names on my head right now, but they follow a quite similar model, just different implementation of the backends. But that works right now and there are a lot of examples out there that took whole games like Doom or uh, Sauerbraten, which are actually 3D ego shooters, ported that to JavaScript and you can now play it in the browser at near native speed. Uh, especially in Firefox and Chrome where this code is optimized. Um, which now brings us to WebAssembly. WebAssembly is actually a new portable size and load time efficient format suitable for compilation to the web. Well, that's quite a bit. Let's strip that down first. Um, WebAssembly is a new format suitable for compilation to the web. That's basically what, what uh, the essence here is. Um, it's a new format uh, that we can compile to and that should just run the same as JavaScript. And we actually had similar things before. We had Flash, we had Java applets, and we had other plugins that were integrated into the browser and executed some code. So you might think, what is actually better this time? Well, this time the browser renders meet first and talked about what they actually want. They also talked about, can we just implement that in JavaScript? Can we maybe um, implement that in ASMJS? Do we just need to add more APIs to JavaScript and the DOM? Or do we actually need a new format to make this happen? And well, I do love some hypothetical uh, future of WebAssembly. Um, the working group working on WebAssembly is just a year old, but they have pretty strong goals to achieve. Um, and they already reached one of their goals, which is there is working WebAssembly interpreters in both Chrome and Firefox. You just have to enable them. Uh, I can show you later how that goes. But they already work and they can already um, interpret um, WebAssembly in the way they want it. There are a lot of features missing, but the basic proof of concept that it actually works and brings advantages is there. I just had to include that. I wanted to find a slide where it actually fits, but I didn't. Um, so let's take a look at WebAssembly. WebAssembly is defined as an abstract syntax tree, defining modules of code, where you actually define which functions do you export. You define functions, the input types and the output type, and then the operations they actually perform. So a simple add operation is nothing more than taking two integer 32-bit um, values, return a new integer by adding the existing uh, variables. So nothing really fancy there. Um, well, I often like to say, well, this is more or less just like Lisp again, right? Um, so while we saw the, uh, we saw the simple text representation of that, that doesn't bring much uh, improvement from having JavaScript in the first place because we still need to parse it. It still needs uh, to make sure that it validates and it has a lot of overhead that uh, we don't need. So there is another format which is actually the WASM format, the WebAssembly format. This is the binary format of what we have seen, the abstract syntax tree, just expressed in some binary formats. So instead of writing e32.add, we have just one byte specifying which operation that is. Um, this makes it really, really fast to parse because we can just go through it, check that the operations match from what we expect, and we don't have to check that uh, we have uh, all the parences and, and such stuff. And they made uh, some samples, some benchmarks on how much faster this actually is. And it turns out compared to pure JavaScript parsing, parsing the binary format is at least, or it is 20 times faster than just parsing the JavaScript. So from the parsing side, we already get quite an improvement there. And what they also wanted to have is that even though this is binary, 
there will always be a one-to-one -one translation to the text format. So we will always be able to get some text format, uh, however unreadable, but that should give you um, at least the basic source code that you can still work with. Like it's the same with JavaScript, a lot of JavaScript out there is already minified or uh, somehow, somehow else uh, obfuscated, but you still have access to the source. You could modify it or deobfuscate it, deminify it and work from that. The same is here the case. We don't want to have a pure binary format that no one can ever interact with apart from the ones that actually wrote the high level code first. And as mentioned, there is now native support in Chrome and Firefox, so you can actually test it out. So again, you will probably ask, why, 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 why do we want this? I mentioned a few things already. It's faster to pass, and there are less restrictions to ASM uh, compared to ASM.js. Basically, uh, ASM.js is still a subset of JavaScript, so it is restricted to the syntax that is there. It can't introduce anything else besides applying operation and saying that this is now um, a of a certain type. And it also uh, is quite strict in how we can apply out of time compilation. In the ASM.js case, we always need to annotate code, so we know that it can be pre-compiled. But in the case of WebAssembly, we have one strict format. We know we can always pre-compile because it won't change at runtime. It simply does not have the functionality. And what they also wanted to do is they want to end thread and SIMD support to the core language or as features of WebAssembly itself. This is only a goal that's probably far into the future and only uh, reserved for stage two of WebAssembly. But this was brought forward as one of the advantages. In JavaScript, they would have uh, proposed a new API to JavaScript, have to implement that, have to deal with how JavaScript works at the moment. And it's pretty hard to do another threading model on top of what JavaScript has there at the moment. So this is what we have right now is MGS and WebAssembly. And now take a look, let's take a look at what's the story with Rust. Well, the story with Rust is it worked once. For some pretty, pretty old uh, version of Rust, there were scripts around that got you a hacky working version of Rust C with support for mscripten. But often they were based on some patches that were definitely breaking once you upgrade the Rust or the LLVM that is used. Um, it often also hacked together how the standard library got compiled. And when you use this one compiler, you, it's probably not possible to target the native uh, host. So you, can't, you can compile through mscript into JavaScript, but you can't compile a normal binary anymore. And as I said, it only worked for some pretty, pretty old versions. Um, and there was one major uh, thing that blocked advancing this forward, and that is mscripten uses LLVM, but it uses its own fork that was forked a long time ago. And it only backported patches from LLVM when it saw them fit, and sometimes upgraded to the latest LLVM, but very slowly. So there is no clear base that you can just take the mscripten patches, put them on the current LLVM, and you're done. They are working on that right now. They are actually at a base of LLVM 3.9 right now, so we're getting there. But the problem there was Rust only supported LLVM 3.7 and 3.8. So we, still, we were still far ahead, uh, away. So then some uh, folks from the Rust core team and me, we sat down and took a look at what's actually, what's actually necessary to upgrade Rust to a newer LLVM. And uh, in the end, it only took us uh, 167 comments. It took 33 commits. It took two, 22 change files and a dozen of uh, build bot runs uh, and additionally five failed burst retries uh, from the pull request itself to actually get this change merged. As it turns out, the LLVM people like to turn around the API from release to release. And that now they not only change the API forward, but they also change it back. So we now have uh, patches that actually work for 3.7 and 3.9, but for 3.8, you call another API. So this is pretty, pretty weird. 
And we have to deal with that because we still want to support the old LLVM because it should be possible to compile on a system where LLVM is already existing. But in the tree, we now have LLVM 3.9, or at least something that's very, very close to what just got released. Um, so how close are we really? Well, from there, it now only takes 10 to 15 more steps to get a working compiler using mscript. Uh, this is better than before, but it's not really good. So we have plans on being better on that as well. And first and foremost, we need to make sure that the test suite of Rust does not fail when compiled with mscript. A lot of the tests simply test if you can execute threads or call external programs or comp uh, call into dynamically loaded libraries, and that's simply not possible if you compile to mscript and run that through Node.js. So we first need to disable those uh, tests and later fix the other tests that are still failing. We then need to make sure that we actually get the LLVM that mscript also uses. But the maintainer of uh, mscript is helping us out there, and he cleaned up mscript's LLVM and now made it based on 3.9. And we have 3.9 entry as well. So what we now have to do is figure out what are the actual patches of mscript that are needed, bring them into Rust, and from there on, we would have a working mscript build. And once that is done, we will actually test that on BuildBot as well. And once we got the simple mscript target, we will target WebAssembly as well. mscript already has experimental support for uh, WebAssembly through two methods. Either it compiles to ASMJS and puts that into WebAssembly, which is basically a two-step compilation, or it directly targets WebAssembly. We will need to figure out what's the best way and most stable way there. And once that is done, we can then finally create compiling Rust on WebAssembly or ASMJS demos. So this is where we are right now. And if you want to help out, please feel free to go to rustlang slash rust slash issues slash 33205 and show us that you want to help. We would appreciate that. Um, but in the meantime, there's actually one more thing we can do. And that is compile Rust directly to WebAssembly. Do you all remember Mir, the uh, intermediate representation of Rust? Well. It's now possible to take that, don't use LLVM at all, and instead directly provide a new backend that takes the mirror, compiles that to WebAssembly, and put, uh, outputs it to the file. So this is what some people already did. Um, it's actually a new backend for Rust. Uh, you wouldn't need LLVM for that at all. Um, it's completely in parallel to the other efforts, and it's uh, called mirror to Vazen. Uh, it's built on uh, Miri, which is an interpreter for the Mir, which was a student project by someone, which probably gets upstreamed as the compile time const evaluator in Rust itself at some point, or at least parts of it. So we share resources there as well. And this actually works. Um, I will show an example later, but first look what it actually does. So this is some pretty simple Rust code. It adds to integers. When you run that through a Rust C and output the mirror code, or what mirror thinks it should look like, it's this. It's a bit bigger, but actually you can see, still see there's an addition in the middle. And from there on, it just returns the numbers. Um, it's, I don't know why it needs so many temporary variables, but it probably has some good reasons for that. Um, that's actually already the at least Rust optimized code. So LLVM will throw away a lot of that as well. But we don't use LLVM, we use um, uh, mir 2 version now. So if we put that through that, we get this uh, bus code. Um, I'm not 100% sure why it does the store const lord const thing there. It's uh, also the optimized build. I'm not, pretty sure, uh, not really sure what it does. Um, for this example, I'm actually sure it's not necessary. But for some bigger example, it might be that it needs to load something from the memory. So we can run this. And now it's demo time. I took the Rust compiler at the mscript and thingies, followed my 15 steps that are in a gist. You can follow that later. And compiled some code, which already works. And I like to uh, try that out right now. 
So let's see. Oh. Do we have, where do we have it? Oh. There we go. Oh. Okay, I need to close this first. Um, let's see. Okay. Oh. Okay, so what I did is I took the Rust SHA-1 uh, crate and compiled it to ASMGS with mscripten and basically put some uh, code around that to make it work in JavaScript and you, you type it now. You say it calculates the uh, SHA-1 sum just uh, right in the browser and if you take a look, um, there we go. So basically we load this huge file and just say, well, there's a function in there we know and we'll just call it whenever we type something. And what you will now see is what mscripten outputs. It's pretty much boilerplate up there, but there should be a digest function in there. Oh. So there it's calling digest at once, and well, there it is. Obviously. So, what, what I had to do is like I needed to provide a wrapper because the mscripten uh, wrapper part expects C strings as well. So I need to call the, uh, well, the right functions to get C strings in Rust and translate that to strings, pass it onto the SHA-1 library and turn it back and everything. But well, it uh, works. So that's for that. Okay. Okay, so. Um, as it turns out, there is WebGL support in most browsers now, which basically gives you an OpenGL-like context to provide graphics. And mscripten already translates OpenGL code to WebGL code, so you can just provide an OpenGL example, at least if you're not using any fancy features. Uh, compile that and get um, some JavaScript code that uses WebGL. And now it's downloading 11 megabytes of JavaScript, <laughs> and it shows a moving keyboard. And you can see the GC pauses, right? <laughs> I'm actually not entirely sure what it is. I, I just think, like, considering that I don't have a real graphic card, it might be broken. Anyway, so this already works. Um, I know at least some while back when there was the hacky version of Rust CNM scripts and there was like a Minecraft demo example, someone compiled that and executed in the browser. So even that is possible. Okay. And last one. I took this code of uh, Rust. I compiled it using mirror to buzzin to this. So you can see, not that hard. And if you now change it, you get the factorial of 12. And one funny thing as well, well, you can't do 20, it's too big. You can do 90, which works, and you can 80. So yeah, as it turns out, uh, well, uh, JavaScript only has doubles, uh, so you can't represent all the, um, yeah, all the uh, integers out there. So um, at some point it will wrap but it's probably good enough at this point. Um, yeah, so first, do you have questions regarding this? Uh, One question concerning uh, Mirto Vasm. Um, is this a goal to make this as fast as LLVM? Because LLVM has so many uh, optimizations in there, and so you're throwing all this away if you do a direct translation from Mir to Vasm. Yes, that is uh, true. LLVM does a lot of optimizations, but there will be more optimizations on Mir. A lot of optimizations were actually blocked by not having Mir, so we will get better optimized Mir. And what Mir to Vasm is using is binary yen, which is a proof of concept implementation by the same guy as mscripten, who took a lot of the mscripten uh, optimizations, put that in there, and use that to generate uh, WebAssembly. So yes, we will lose a lot of the optimizations as LLVM probably could do, but we will use other optimizations that mscripten will also do. And also, um, mscripten also does the same. Opt uh, mscripten uses a lot of the optimizations from LLVM itself, 
which then outputs JavaScript, but it will then use an uh, optimizer on this generated JavaScript to strip it down again. Because some of the code that falls out from the first step is working JavaScript, but you can, um, especially with regards to garbage collection, you can optimize it quite well, like removing additional variables, remove all the temporaries that LLVM couldn't find, um, try to split up functions where possible, because all these are pretty uh, much bound to how the actual uh, JavaScript engines work. So yeah, uh, for Mirto Vazen, we will benefit a bit from Mir and binary gen, but not from LLVM anymore. Uh, that's probably a broad question, but what's the state of native DOM bindings and other JavaScript APIs to so, MScript and Rust? Um, like the bindings to WebGL are pretty easy because MScript does it. Uh, there is a crate called Web Platform, which provides a lot of wrappers around uh, native APIs in Rust. This is pretty hacky because it actually relies on calling and just generating um, some JavaScript code at compile time and using that. Um, otherwise, we don't have a clear way um, to access the DOM at the moment. Well, there are thoughts about how to actually do this. There might be ways to actually automatically generate bindings at some level. Um, we hope that the server people will also give us some utilities because they're already doing some of this stuff because they have to bind to the DOM as well. So there will hopefully be some uh, joint effort to do this. But I can probably, as it's demo time anyway, uh, we can take a look at what platform. I can show you the code it takes to actually bind stuff. Um, no, this is a wrong one. So this is actually one of the examples I used a while ago. And what it does is, um, up, 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 up. so, okay, um, up, 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 up. there. Um, it binds by having some form of JavaScript in there that actually calls into some uh, MScript and APIs. So it just gets placed as JavaScript in the compiled output. And so this is what it would take right now. It's pretty much unsafe but it works, but it's definitely not nice and only for the limited cases we implemented or that were implemented. I did this for some jQuery functions just so I could have Ajax calls in Rust, but it was pretty ugly, especially if you do the DIN calls and have to provide the right arguments to make it sure that it passes integers and such. Um, I'm just wondering what limitations uh, MScript currently has. We could, just for a little reference, uh, just a few years ago, uh, we went to compile C++ to, M to MScript, and this was something like you uh, were not allowed to use exceptions because you couldn't use that. Certain syscalls were, of course, not, of course not allowed, like file opening was a thing and all this stuff. So, so what do you have to, to look for when you write code that you want to transpile to so, yeah. MScript? Everything that does anything dynamically in C or C++, uh, like loading anything external, will definitely fail. Uh, there's no threading support, though that might come once it's available in WebAssembly. And yeah, like everything that handles files, there's no translation to any API in the browser. Um, so basically, this is a lot of the things. And if you, especially if you port uh, games, um, which have a lot of resources you need to load, uh, this is a place to look out for. So you need to load them somewhere or put them somewhere and pass it um, after loading in the browser or something else. What, what you can do though, um, one thing I didn't mention is, um, so right now the memory buffer that gets allocated is somewhat determined be, be, uh, to be at some uh, size, but you can provide it some initial memory. So you just give it a memory file where you can already place your uh, stuff in there so you basically already have a global buffer for resources you can put stuff in. So I guess this was the Unreal demo did because it was like a few hundred megabytes yeah. as far as I remember. Like, like uh, the teapot I showed you, it's yeah. 11 megabyte. Yeah. And a lot of, of course, of, a lot of that is the boilerplate of MScript in itself. But at that point, of course, um, 
it's a lot of the GL stuff that has to be translated and the resources that uh, needs to be included there. But as you said, oh sorry if someone else says, but <laughs> one, one follow-up question. Uh, you said this with the pre-allocated heap. So how does it actually decide how large this thing is? Do I'm, you have to give it? Or? I'm actually not quite sure. So I know it because I read it, the mere 2 wasn example, where we just set a buffer of, I think, 256, just because we don't know what to do. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure how mscript decides it at the moment. But um, it at least gives you that, uh, well, if you go over the memory buffer, um, uh, it will give you an undefined value, so the following code will definitely fail at some point. It won't give you nice error me messages, but yeah, well, you won't crash the browser with a sec fault. So I was a bit surprised about um, uh, integers being represented as doubles, uh, if I understood yes. correctly. So, um, because that um, obviously changes behavior of the program. Um, is there yes. uh, any plan to? Uh, no, JavaScript simply specifies that all numbers in the program are doubles, and that means you can only re represent uh, integers precisely up to a certain limit. And that's it. There's no way to do this uh, anywhere else. The thing is, if you do this optimizations with the binary or zero, the engine will actually interpret, uh, know, understand that you have using an integer, and in the low-level um, code it produces, there will be an integer used, not a double. Okay. So okay. if so, you do so these optimizations, you get the good code, but from a high-level view of the programmer, you can't rely on having integers. Uh, okay. Um, this so, actually so, so is it, pros, is it, uh, is it correct to say that the actual calculation is correct, but um, uh, when it uh, goes to the representation, um, the, it's cast to double or? Yes. Like if you oh, okay, get it back into JavaScript, it will be a double again. Okay. And uh, that, that will break, of course, for big numbers. That was actually a problem for quite some uh, applications out there, like Twitter using. Uh, integers in their front-end code for the IDs, IDs of the tweets, which at some point broke because, of course, uh, with a double you're limited in how large your IDs can be. And uh, this broke once they reach a certain number of tweets. And this is a known uh, limitation of JavaScript. And, well, the assembler.js is trying to prevent this by providing additional types, but they are all emulated in the sense that it's JavaScript. Okay, if there are no more questions, I still have material. Because um, hands on time. Well, um, you, if you're doing Rust, you probably uh, know uh, the playground, where you convert code, compile it in the browser, and execute it. As it turns out, you can also do this with my one. You, oh, ah, it's cached. Wait, great. So um, what I did is I replaced the backend and used my Rust compiler that compiles to JavaScript and then execute that. Uh, send it back to the browser and execute it there. And as you can see on the very last line, you get a hello world. Um, and if you still have time, which you do, um, I can insert this part of the code. So what we are now doing, this is uh, um, mscript and API which actually tells you just input this kind of looking JavaScript into the code and execute it. And there we call it with just a string of alert. So, oh, that's still cached. Okay, great. So it works. It executes the JavaScript, but now to make it show you what the problem is, so this is new code. Um, it actually compiles on my server now. And it takes about, I don't know, one to two minutes. So while this is working, it should pop up eventually. Um, I said I compiled the Rust compiler. And uh, I actually, because yay, big Docker images, I put that into a Docker image. So if you want to test it out, you can just pull my Docker image and uh, try it out. Um, where do I have it open? There it is. Did it compile? Is it still not compiled? 
So yeah, it actually takes quite some time. I can take a look at what's the lock saying. <sighs> Where is it? Input written, no waiting. It actually also launches the Docker container to launch Rust-C. But it's a slow part of the compilation. Mm -hmm. It's really slow. What is the slow part of the compilation? Um, I actually have no oh. idea. Um, I, I really don't know what mscript is doing there because it's just, oh, did it work? It worked. Um, I'm, I'm still not sure what's so slow there because in theory it, it shouldn't. Like at least not that slow. I mean, especially for this small code, there's not a lot it has to do. Like it's pretty easy. It should understand how to do that. Um, so this will basically be the next step of actually Getting once we get the bug fixed and the test fixed, we need to take a look why it's so slow. Is it um, the the Rust part? Is it the LLVM part, or is it actually the MScript part? So yeah, I don't know. It could be that um, the actual output from Rust is a bit longer than just this function. There is a lot of boilerplate that ultimately gets generated and inserted from the standard library, and it might take uh, some time for it to realize. Uh, well that it can all optimize that away because it's never called. So, yeah. I mean, only the print ln line already goes through the formatter. Then uh, it needs to find where to write to, which is actually a placement and now writes to the console. So there are a lot of traits and implementations in the standard library touched. So probably this optimization. Okay. Now we got a shell here. Um, so, uh, can you? Uh, oh, take this. So, um, I pulled this. So, if you ever want to try it, um, you can launch the Docker container from my script, and you now have the hello s. And if you just compile it, it works. It says hello world. And if you want to compile it for uh, for temporary. Oh, where did it? Um, skip. So it now takes the code and turns that into the JavaScript part. Again, it takes quite some time. For some, it didn't even finish. For me, it, it took like, what was it, 30 seconds, 60 seconds? Quite slow. And yeah, it's doing something. I have actually no idea what, what it does. Like the EMCC step, which is the compiler of mscripten, it's already quite slow. Um, it, it, well, it first launches the LLVM part again and then also does its JavaScript optimization on, the, on top of that. So uh, probably a lot of time is spent there. Oh, it's done. Okay, so um, we can take a look. There's no hello.js file. Oh, come on. As you can see, again, the same. And if we execute that, we get hello world. So it even works there. Okay, so if you want to try that out, um, just pull that container. It might get a bit smaller next day and uh, start it. Uh, I can also give you a USB stick if you trust me and use it from there. And if you have any questions left, how that all works or why that works or why we want it, now is the time to ask. Um, so since I have the microphone, um, when was the point or what was the reason for you to, to uh, get interested in this and get, uh, yeah, because uh, you actually did a lot of uh, stuff on this? Uh, it yeah, so actually how I got started was that I was uh, invited to give a talk about a random topic of the thing I wanted to do and at that point I looked a lot into using Rust for web development but just represent, uh, presenting what Rust does for backend development is quite uninteresting because yeah, we're getting there, we have a lot of tools and such. And so I looked at what we could do as well, and then there was Servo, which does the rendering of everything, but there was still something missing. So I took a look at how to actually run Rust in the browser, and now I have a full stack example that has a Rust 
uh, application all the way from the back to the front, including the browser. That was how I got started. And when I started, I, there were already these hacks around that built you the Rust C with uh, mscripten. And yeah, when then uh, Brian came up with saying we want that upstream at some point, I was like, okay, I will do that. And actually, um, I got hooked on this because I could contribute to the Rust compiler without breaking it too much, I saw. <laughs> and then it turned out, well, there's so much broken in LLVM, and now, well, it took 33 commits to actually make it happen. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Then thank you. <laughs>